are again at the Animal House. This is Johnny Cashmere and Trent Aston of the Backseat Boys bringing you another seminar. Today we have from WWE, the former head trainer, Dr. Tom Pritchard. Yeah, you know, uh, us being the best tag team in the world and all that, we figured it'd be a good treat to our students to invite down one of the best half one of the best tag teams around, Emily Bodies. He was in more than one good tag team. He was also one of the body dominants. That's right. He is a tag team extraordinaire, a true doctor like to of the say sport. Tag team specialist. Tag team specialist, a true master of the sport. Uh, he's a guy that likes to give back to the younger wrestlers. We have a great crew here at the Animal House, and they're looking to learn. They have their notebooks and pens out for his lecture. I got my notebook. I can't wait to get in the ring. Camera's on, go ahead. This is the finish. Go ahead. Dr. Tom, that was fantastic, man. The hey, students man. learned so much. They're, they're reeling about it. Our phone's been ringing off the hook to have you back in Philly. We want to get you back in Philly ASAP. Trent, was that not yeah, one of man. the best? Thank you so Same much, time, dude. Yes. I mean, like, look, I even learned, too. I told you I wrote my notebook, and I even learned as well. Oh, man, know? let me see what you wrote no, down. No, 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 you don't have to read it right now. These are my private notes, oh, man. Oh, I got you, man. Hey, guys, I really appreciate it, too, because anytime time I come to Philly, this is my kind of town, man. And these are my kind of students. The ones who have the passion, the desire, and dedication that want to do this stuff, man. That's what I really like teaching. And that's what I really like doing, man. Getting in with a new generation and the guys that really love this business. They are the future of the business. And I'm glad to be so happy. Dude, man, thank you for being so totally cool to our students, man. I'm sure they're all going to be talking about this. And they are going to be doing their studies as well. Yeah. And uh, once again, dude, thank you for coming Anytime, to our school, man. dude. Like dude, a great pleasure. pleasure. Hey, you might have screwed me over last night. There might have been some controversy. Uh, hey, hey, man. Hey, man, now much love. You are, you are, yeah. true, you you are a true know. star of the sport, man. Well, I have nothing but respect for you. I appreciate it, man. I'm just happy to help the younger generation. If I can do anything at all to help them get where they need to be, that's what I'm doing now. Guys, once again, peace out. Man. Take care. All right. Um, you guys ready? Yep, good. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys for coming out on a Sunday afternoon because, um, especially after last night, uh, who all worked on the show last night? Yeah, a bunch of guys worked. So, coming out on a Sunday afternoon after working hard is uh, very much appreciated by me, and I know that uh, Trent and Johnny appreciate it too. Let me also start out by saying, um, every time I do a seminar or camp, people always seem to be looking for that one answer, or that one magical thing I can tell them, how to get to the next level, or how to get to WWE. Not everybody wants to get to WWE, and I understand that, but chances are, all of you, watched something on wrestling or saw somebody on wrestling that made you go, man, I want to do that. Or I want to be like that guy. Whether it was Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, even the Ultimate Warrior, Hulk Hogan, whoever it might be, that got you thinking, when I grow up, I want to do that. Because it looks cool. It's fun. I want to be that kind of guy. The business should be fun. It should be interesting. It should give you something that you want to come and do. You should want to come to work, get in the ring, and spend however long it is, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, or whatever, however long your match is. That time in the ring is what most of us live for. Even if you travel 200 miles, spend 4 hours on the road to get in the ring and do 5 minutes. When I was working, that's what I lived for. That was the main thing, I mean, in my life. Just to get in the ring and spend that time. The business uh, has changed quite a lot in the last 20 years. It is about the camaraderie. It is about working together. It is about going out there and having the best match you possibly can. But what a lot of people don't understand is there's a lot of elements to this business besides just going in the ring. What you do in the ring is important, yes. You 
You have to know how to work. You have to know how to uh, get your match over. You have to know how to get yourself over. But there are a, a, a thousand more elements outside the ring that come into play as well. These days, WWE is a publicly owned company, which means they have stockholders and events and uh, his officers have to answer to the stockholders, and that's understandable. So they want their, their boys, their crew, to be professional. They want them to dress nice, they want them to come in and act professional, not be jack-offs, not get arrested, uh, not do things that would embarrass the company. That's understandable as well. But what you also have to understand about professional wrestling and sports entertainment. The foundation for sports entertainment is professional wrestling. If you don't have a solid foundation, in other words, if you can't lock up, uh, grab a headlock, grab an arm, do simple basics and have a solid foundation, if you ever get to WWE, you will be exposed real quick. The Big Show was a guy who came in on top in the business because of the size. Went to WCW, immediately started working with Hulk Hogan. Never had to pay any dues. They just took him, gave him a crash course, and by God, he was a superstar. When he came to WWF at that time, he found out the hard way but he wasn't ready because in WWE you have to be able to tell a story and you have to be able to know what to do in the ring, even if you're a giant. You may not ever use an arm bar, you may not ever use a headlock, you may not, may not ever take a backdrop in your career, but you need to know it in case you get lost in the ring, in case you need to grab a hold, in case you need to figure out how to transition from one spot to another. Because if you don't, you'll get lost real quick and people will see right through you. Therefore, when I teach a class or a seminar or a camp, I'm doing a wrestling school in Tennessee these days, I start from the very bottom, from how you walk in the ring, how you lock up, how you grab a hold, how you sell a hold. This whole business is about selling. You're selling what you're doing. You're selling what's happening to you. You're selling sometimes the reaction to the crowd. And I say sometimes, I'll explain that in a minute. But selling is what we're doing. When you walk out of that curtain, all eyes are on you. You're working from the moment you walk out of the curtain until you walk back, all the way back. Every step you take in the ring, every step, and I mean in every movement, literally every movement, every eye movement, every look, every little inconsequential things will add up to the big things. So, when you're in the ring, you don't want to throw a wasted punch. You don't want to throw a wasted kick. I see a lot of times guys throwing five, six punches to the face, backing the guy in the rope, doing a real big high spot. Looks good, but it doesn't always make sense. And it's not really adding to the credibility of the business. And I will say, a lot of things WWE does on a regular basis doesn't add credibility to the business. And that's why they're not really on gangbusters right now. But you on this level, and I say this level because it's independence, the more credibility you add, the better matches you do, the more people you're going to draw because you will get the reputation out there and you'll get the word out there that this is a show you want to come and see. But a lot of times guys will go out there and try and be something they're not and try and do things they don't really know how to do but they've seen it on TV so they try and copy it on in the ring. 
then it looks like a cheap ripoff. The best characters and the best personas, the most over personas in the business, has, have always been, it's always been an extension of who that person really is. Stone Cold Steve Austin did not start out being Stone Cold Steve Austin. He started out in Dallas, Texas as Steve Austin. Then they added Stunning Steve Austin. He was a Texas redneck with long stringy blonde hair, wore biker shorts, white boots, and an imitation Ric Flair, Ric Flair robe that was already coming apart at the scene before he even got it. Calling himself Stunning Steve Austin. He was a great worker, great athlete, but it really wasn't him. He was getting over, he was, his talent was helped getting him over, but he never really got past that stage until they went to WCW. And he became Stunning Steve Austin with a haircut. King of Brian Pillman became the Hollywood Blondes. And they were starting to get over, but all of a sudden they had that glass ceiling and they hit it. Austin always had the talent, but he really wasn't finding his niche until they went to WWF. And then they really found his niche with the Ringmaster. Or actually went to WC or ECW first. Paul Heyman gave him the opportunity to get do interviews. Let his real personality come out. Steve used his real life experiences from being fired from WCW, had that rage inside, was pissed off, and got the vent on ECW TV. And he got to get some of the stuff off his chest. Jim Ross used to watch that show every Friday night on TNT. That is how Austin got his foot in WWE. But they gave him the gimmick of the ringmaster with green tights, white boots. Ted DiBiase doing his talk. Ted DiBiase doing the talking for Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> Steve knew that was a nowhere going gimmick fast and he is the one who evolved. He is the one who became Stone Cold Steve Austin. He made that decision he made that recommendation and suggestion, and it was Stone Cold Steve Austin who decided he was going to shave his head, become a redneck, beer drinking, foul mouth guy that he is today. It was an extension of Steve. That was Steve. That is Steve. He likes to drink beer, likes to raise hell, straightforward in your face. But he evolved into that. That's what you have to do. You have to be something that is real. You have to be who you are. I know you guys have heard this before with the volume turned up. But it has to be real. You can't go out there and play a tough guy if you're not really a tough guy. You can. But you have to learn how to be it. You have to go out there and make people believe it. It has to be real. You have to feel it in the ring to make everybody out here feel it. If, they, if, you, if you're in the ring faking it, so to say, or pretending to be something that you're not, people can see through it whether you know it or not. But if you go in the ring and give them that element of doubt, like, maybe this guy really is crazy. Maybe this guy really is fucked up. Jesus Christ. That's what you're looking for. Before, we, before Vince McMahon got on and told everybody, hey, it's a work, we all get along, we're all friends, there was an era of mystery to the business. Not everybody believed in it, not everybody you know, thought it was all on the up and up. But there was an era of mystery to some of the guys who would come out and you would look at them and say, man, they're either really crazy or they're really tough guys. 
I know with all the, uh, especially here because I saw it last night on the table, with all the access you guys have with DVDs and old matches, if you look back and check out a guy like Jake Roberts and see how he did his promos, see how he got over in his matches, and understand that psychology of Jake Roberts talking low and telling you a story and talking about the depths of hell and he's going to grab your soul and he has Damien around his neck and then he raised his voice and got louder and then he kind of get even closer and talk about all this evil whacked out shit that was that was Jake Jake would talk about that stuff even in the cars just trying to get a reaction but he talked about it and did it so much it became him it is real in my opinion that's what the business is missing today you have too many manufactured characters too many cookie cutter characters in WWE. Now, I'm not going to knock WWE. I'm just going to tell you what I feel on the facts. This business was built on. It's a renegade business, guys. Not everybody could get into it. It was a hard business to crack in, to break into, because it was kept very secretive, and they didn't want outsiders in. It's not as easy to get into today either, but it's a lot easier than it was because of the wrestling school seems to be on every corner. And guys want to come in and be wrestlers and play the game and do all this stuff. Not always for the better. But you can look at some of the old tapes, look at some of the old timers, and you could see how it might have had a little more credibility because these guys were who they were with the volume turned up. You really had these crazy guys. Moondog Maine, and I know none of you guys were even born, but Moondog Maine is the guy you want to look up and see how crazy he was. Uh, Jake was legitimately nuts. Mark Lewin, another guy, called himself Maniac Mark Lewin. He was a maniac. Dusty Rhodes believed he was American Dream. Terry Funk. I recommend every one of you guys go out and find Terry's book and read it because he talks about the psychology of an interview. He talks about how the psychology of doing a match came about and still works today. It's about good versus evil. You have a heel, you have a baby face. Necess not necessarily do the people cheer the baby face these days, they might cheer the heel, but the psychology is still the same. If you go in a ring, here's the way I explain it to a lot of people. If you're working a match for the first time in front of a crowd that doesn't know who you are, and you're trying to establish a heel and a baby face, the, ba the heel doesn't always come out to the ring and get cheap people and say, hey, you old fat bitch. You know, your mom was ugly too, and all this other bullshit. That's cheap heat. A worker will go in the ring and show that the babyface cannot wrestle him or outmaneuver him or do these things that, that, that are uh, quick and get away and all this good stuff. The heel then gets frustrated, and that's the reason he has to take a cheap shot. That's the reason he gets the upper hand by, by cheating and, and doing things like that. That tells the story. Now you know this guy could wrestle, and he has skill, but the other guy's just beating him to the punch. He's that one step quicker. So take that cheap shot, boom. Now the people understand, oh, you bastard. Did you have to do that? That's cheap shot. It's not cheap heat. Too many guys rely on cheap heat by just going out and telling somebody they're ugly or telling somebody all take your girlfriend at the end of the night or something. And you could do that too at the right time. But to really tell a story in the ring and to establish a heel and a baby face, the heel's job, number one, and again, there's always exceptions to rules, but the heel calls the match because he knows how to set the heat and he knows when he needs the baby face to come back. 
That is, unless the babyface has more experience in that heel, then he can call the match because he knows he wants the heel to set the heat and he knows when he's supposed to come back. So there's always exceptions. But you have to remember the basic psychology of a match is you go out there and you tell a story. You have a beginning, you have a middle, and then you have an end. And you guys, as the workers in the ring, are the ones calling the match. You know how to set the tempo. If you have people out here, you know, and last night, it was a good crowd, but sometimes they could get on you and say boring and all that stuff. You don't let the people call your matches. You guys are the conductors in the ring. If they're not getting with you in the beginning, don't get frantic and don't get frazzled and all that stuff. Settle down, grab a hold, regroup. Then you call a spot. Then you get it. But you build that match. Has anybody watched the Chris Benoit DVD? Who has? The match on there with Regal versus Benoit at the Pillman Memorial. It was a match that I used to bring and, and show people uh, when I do camps. Reason being, Chris Benoit is one of the most intense workers in this business. He's believable. He is not a big guy. He is believable though. He, he looks the part. He looks like a wrestler. He looks like a grip your head off. They went out, Regal and Benoit went out in the Brian Pillman Memorial in this sweat box. It was a big field house, no air conditioning, man. It was miserable. And there were just, there were smart fans there, there were hardcore fans there. And Regal had just got out, got out of rehab. Regal was on the outs. He was just making his comeback. He was teaching the developmental territory in Memphis. And they booked this match, Les Thatcher booked this match at the Pillman Memorial. Both guys went out there, as soon as the match started, two minutes into it, people were chanting boring. But they didn't get excited. And Juan and Regal kept their match going. By the end of that, I think it was a 12 minute match, 11 minute match, whatever it was, the people were on their feet, giving them both a standing ovation. Because they took their time, they told their story, and they didn't let the people dictate their match. It's a good learning tool for anybody who wants to understand how to build a match. And you do build a match by putting your high spots and putting all the great things you want to do in the right place. You can't have a 1970s and 1980s match all the time. You can't because people do demand more. But I saw some stuff last night. It was a great show, by the way. But I did see some stuff last night that guys were doing spots, uh, not really in the right place or doing it at the right time. You can do those spots, you can do that stuff, but build it and, and lead into it. I know these these people here. You have a niche. You have a, you have a, a group of fans who demand that you guys give that extra effort, and you guys did. You did great last night. But the hardest thing to do in the ring is slow down. Take your time. Because if you rush, you're going to mess up, you're going to hurt somebody, or you're going to hurt yourself. Um, once you relax and get in that mode where you get in the ring and you tell a story, Yes, you have to do spots, but in between there, it's that link in between after you do a spot, what do you do? Grab a hold. And I'm not, I'm not saying grab a hold where you bore people, but grab a hold and sell it. You sell when you have the hold on the guy, and the guy in the hold has to sell it, and sell it believably, sell it naturally. Too many guys oversell. Too many guys look like it's phony. Too many guys make it look phony. You have to feel the pain in the hold. You have to feel it. You have to get in that mindset. 
When you're in the ring, this has to be real to you so everybody else out there believes it's real. It's not easy, and it doesn't happen overnight. In the old days, I won't say in my day, in the old days, guys had to work five nights a week for at least five years before anybody would even let them call a match or have any faith in them calling a match. It's hard these days because you don't have that. You're lucky if you work sometimes three times a month. I understand that. But if you want it that bad, you can get yourself booked out other places. Do you have to go far and travel? Hell yeah. Do you want it? How bad do you want it? It's not easy, and it's not for everybody. But if you want this business, and you want to make it, even if you, you just want to do it on the indie level and have fun, that's fine. That's great. Why would you? You ought to strive to at least get better on this level, too, so when people see your matches and you have a guy like Chris Daniels or Chris Saban, uh, even Bobby Roode, some of these guys on the independent scene that, that do travel from place to place, you would like to get to their level with it where you can tell a story. Even AJ Styles, who does all the fantastic stuff, I believe is coming back around and knowing how to tell a story. Another reason for that is because in the last couple years, last five years, I think we've had over 12, I don't know what the exact number, of neck injuries in WWE. You don't want to hurt yourself because once you do that and you have to have a neck injury, you're out of work, man. You don't get paid and you don't work, right? Nobody here has a big contract. You can do the high risk spots, you can do the maneuvers, but make sure you do them at the right time. And you don't have to do all of them in the same match. You don't have to do every spot you know in that one match. Learning psychology comes by doing a match doing matches on a consistent basis. Learning what works and learning what doesn't. Sandman was asking uh, Trent last night, or asking me last night, do you listen to the people all the time? Yes. You listen to them, but you don't let them dictate your match. You listen to what they're buying. If they're sitting there doing a slow murmur, then you know you need to do something to get them interested in your match. Get them back into it. Um, there's no way that we never know what's going to work in a match. We never know who's going to get over uh, or be the next superstar. Nobody can tell you, say, you'll never make it. Nobody can say that because we don't know. Mick Foley was told he'd never make it. Steve Austin was told he would never draw a dime in this business with black boots and black tights. Wouldn't draw a dime. What got Austin over, he has never done a hurricanrana in his life. I don't believe he's ever done a plancha or a toupee. All Steve did was come to the ring and be an ass-kicking son of a bitch. Did an ass-kicking promo. It's that intangible it factor that we have to find. We have to find it in ourselves. Who are we? Who would want to pay money to come see us? Nobody wants to come pay money to see their next door neighbor or a backyard wrestler. That's why it's important to get in the gym, look like wrestlers, look like an athlete, and at the same time, find your niche. Think about it, guys. You're going into a business with Guys who call themselves the Undertaker, now the Boogeyman. Uh, you know, it, it's it's an eccentric group of people. You don't want to be normal. That's why you're here. You want to be different. You're not part of the regular society out there. I, I never want to be part of society, man. I never want to be like everybody else. This is what I want to be. And this is what I've had the opportunity and I'm very fortunate to be for over 26 years now. 
but I've loved this since I was four years old, and I watched the guys that I admired, and watched the guys that I idolized, and watched how they operated. Then when I got in the business, I watched how they did their stuff too. They were working constantly, not necessarily in the dressing room, but they would work when they went out and just be in public, just to have fun, just to mess with people. But they would always be that person, always be that, not necessarily a character, but they would be that person with the volume turned up. And that's what you have to be when you step in the ring. That's what you have to be when you're in this arena. You have to be somebody other than that guy sitting on the front row. You've got to be special. You've got to be different. Otherwise, why, why would anybody care? Whether it's a look, or the moves you do in the ring, it's got to be different. Now, how do you get to the next level? Everybody, or, or I will say this, almost everybody I've talked to says they want to make it to WWE. That is the pinnacle. That is, you know, if you watch TV, wrestling these days, um, uh, for anything at all, everybody has dreams of being uh, the next Rock, the next Hulk Hogan, the next Steve Austin, the next Triple H, whatever it may be. Well, Chris Jericho is not a big guy. Chris Jericho had visions of being a superstar. And once he got to WCW, there were people around him who said, Chris, you'll never be a superstar. You're too small. You can't make it. You won't make it. Well, Chris wasn't going to listen to that bullshit. And it's bullshit. When Chris left WCW and came to WWE, he had ideas. And he wasn't afraid to, to tell it. He wasn't afraid to tell somebody his ideas. He knew he had the talent. He was given the opportunity, and he seized it. But for two years, guys, or actually a year and a half, I was there. Everything he did, when he would come through the curtain, everything he did in the ring was wrong. Every night. From Vincent Mann to Triple H, Everybody on that crew was telling him he was wrong. Couldn't do anything right. But instead of getting down and getting pissed off, it just made him more determined. And it gave him that fire to succeed. And eventually, he became the first undisputed champion in over four years in WWE. Yes, the belt to work. Yes, it was given to him. But the fact that it was given to Chris Jericho and not Funaki, says a lot. He didn't give up. And he knew how to play the cards and his cards right. It takes ambition. It takes determination. And it takes that one factor that cannot be hidden and it cannot be uh, faked. It's called passion. You have to have passion. And uh, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, but if somebody tells you no, if somebody says you can't make it, and you have that passion deep down inside and you're not going to listen to anybody, by God, you will not be denied. You cannot be denied. I don't care who you are. My whole life I was told I could not make it. I would not be a wrestler. I was too small. Didn't happen. Bullshit. And every day I said bullshit. And I was determined to prove everybody wrong. I was in a karate class one night. We had a speaker come in and he said, there's three kinds of people in this world. First kind of person, will say, I'm going to try. And they will never accomplish their goal because they say, oh, well, at least I tried. Or don't make it, well, at least I tried. Third person says, I'm going to give it my best shot. 
they will never make it either because when they don't make it, they'll say, well, you know what, at least I gave them the best shot. That third kind of person says, whatever it takes, I am going to accomplish my goal. Whatever I have to do to get where I want to be, I'm going to do it. Does it mean coming in early and leaving late? Does it mean coming in in, in the, the freezing weather, the wrestling school, all that bullshit? Okay. I'm going to do it. Rico was 38 years old when we signed him. Because he did not give up and he had talent and he was determined to get his shot. At four years old, he finally made it to the roster. But they wanted to cut him, they being creative. Didn't have anything for him. But Rico was a guy who was talking to his brother on the phone, who was about to commit suicide in Las Vegas. Rico was at a spot show in Kentucky, helping load the ring after the show on the truck while talking to his brother on the cell phone and talking about a shooting himself. and kept coming every day in Louisville, OVW, while he had a family with three kids at home in Vegas, sending money home and existing in Louisville. That's tough. For two years he did that, and they wanted to cut it. Bullshit. And the guys in charge of OVW at that time Spoke up for him and said, at least meet with this guy for 15 minutes. See what kind of human being he is. And give him a shot. And they did. And I thought it was very unfair when he got cut, too. But that's the way it goes. Bobby Roode is another example of use. Who I think is a great talent. He should have been signed a long time ago. Chances are he may get signed. But he's with TNA right now. He's not going to give up. Besides doing what it takes, this business is about timing, being at the right place, at the right time, not giving up. A lot of times you just show up, if you go to Raw or SmackDown and be an extra, not meant to be used, <coughs> Excuse me. but you're there and somebody else didn't show up so they use you. And they see you, and they kind of like what they see, and they keep bringing you around. Then you get a try out in the afternoon, and the guys say, hey man. Let's sign him. That's what happened to the guy in Boston, Aaron Stevens. Kept coming around, coming around. Got signed. Anybody know Johnny Heartbreaker? Who knows Johnny Heartbreaker? Okay. Around Connecticut, around that part. He's an intern at WWE. He wanted to be a wrestler. They don't like guys who want to be wrestlers at WWE. Working for them. They don't like it. They're not necessarily wrestling fans of people who work there. Johnny Heartbreaker wasn't going to give up. He moved on his own dime to OVW. Just for the chance. Working in the, uh, work the beginner's class. Got a job as a waiter. Got signed because he was that good. Eventually got signed because he proved himself. Is it scary doing some of this stuff? Hell yeah. To move and get away from the family, not know what's going down there, get a job as a waiter or get a job doing whatever you don't like to do. Yeah, man. But if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. And once you get there, whether it's OVW or, or some other place, even here, once you get there and you start learning stuff and you start thinking, hey, man, I'm over. I'm big time. That's when you need to really start checking yourself, man. Because even The Undertaker, who is one of the biggest stars in this business, still understands he's just one of the boys. He makes a lot more money than all the boys, but he's just one of the boys. And he's willing to give back, and he's willing to help pass along his knowledge that he's learned throughout the business, and pass along what he's learned in WWE to help the young guys not make the same mistakes. Not coming in thinking you're a superstar. 
not coming in being an asshole, not coming in saying, man, I should be in the main event. You have to have confidence. You have to believe in yourself. But once you cross that line into thinking your shit doesn't stink anymore and by God, you're the greatest goddamn thing that ever happened in this business, you are fucked. The business has changed a lot. We have John, Johnny Ace and talent relations, and he has his way of thinking about things. He has a way of doing things. He's a corporate guy who wants his guys to be corporate people. That's fine. It's their ball game. They can play however they want. My opinion is this business is about individuals, individual personalities, and that's what got it over. That's what made, I think, all of you want to be in it because you saw somebody who was a little bit different. And you said, man, I want to be like that because that just looks like a cool job. That looks like something cool I want to do. And it can be, and it is. But once you get the shot, and once you guys, again, I know you guys have done some stuff on Raw and SmackDown as either bodyguards or extras or, or, or uh, have the students got the opportunity, Johnny, to, to go. But eventually, eventually that is what will happen because when I was in talent relations, it was up to me to find extras when we needed it. Guys to be security guards or some guys to come in and, uh, from the crowd or, or, or take a bump or something like that. But the way you get picked like that is the guys who run the school, the trainers or whatever, take a look at your attitude all around. Who's the guys who show up? Who's the guys who think they're superstars already when they're really not? Who's the guys who are willing to go that extra mile? Who's the guys who are ready to get in the ring and give 110%? Who are the guys who are here on a consistent basis and prove that they want it? And they're not just giving lip service. That's the step you have to take to get, if, if, you're, if your ambitions are to get to WWE, the guys who are gonna book you there are obviously the trainers or the people who run the school. Because those are the guys that uh, Tommy Dreamer is head of, talent, uh, head of that department now will do. They'll call the guys who the school, run the school and say, who are your best students? Who are the guys you would like to take with you? Who are the guys who are going to not embarrass you backstage? Because in WWE, when you first walk in to the backstage area, if you've never seen anything or done anything like this before, you will be in awe. You will be totally, well, maybe not totally, I was. I was intimidated and I'd already been in business 13 years when I got there. It is a different animal than this level right here. But what you will find is you have guys who came in places like this. Because we don't just grab them out of the air. Brock Lesnar was a rarity. Brock Lesnar was a guy that, yeah, we had our eyes on because of his reputation, and Jerry Briscoe follows the amateur guys, and he's the guy who got Brock. But all the other guys in WWE, from Nunzio to Spanky to Jim, uh, uh, Jamie Noble, uh, pretty much all of them, came from the independents and had to start somewhere, just like you guys. And when they got there, some of them found out they weren't as great as they thought they were. Others walked in very, very humble, came down to earth real quick, and learned that you had to fit in, and it takes time. If you guys ever get the opportunity go to WWE and participate in a vignette or do something on Raw or SmackDown as a security guard or whatever it may be. If you see somebody backstage and it's, uh, again, Triple H or Sean or something like that, and they're walking or in, in the lunchroom or something and you haven't even passed them, always shake them. Always come in and introduce yourself. 
They may not know, they may be in a hurry, they may have something on their mind, whatever, they may just be a complete asshole. But you, as a new guy backstage, you as a guy who's out there or, or coming in to do a uh, uh, skit for them, at least shows that you have the etiquette. And it is etiquette. You go up to everyone in the dressing room and say, Hi, my name's John. They may say, Great, nice to meet you. But that's the courtesy, that's the etiquette of the business that you should be taught from day one. You introduce yourself, and then you shut up. And you listen. If you're asked, or if you want to ask a question about something, ask, but ask in a respectful manner. And find the time. Not if they're in the middle of a conversation with Vince, or Johnny Ace, or anything like that. But find the time. Find your place. Also, Dress nice, look the part. If there's a workout going on in the ring, always get your stuff on. Go out and stand around the ring. And if you find an opportunity, don't be shy. Step up and get in the ring to work out. Why? Because the agents are always looking. WWE is always looking for new talent. And in raw SmackDown days, when we have extras come in and going to get in for a workout, they're always looking to see. Well, who's this guy? Where'd he come from? Damn, he's got a good look to him. They'll talk to you. They take your number. May not call you back for months. If you may be back around. They may call and say, "Let's bring that other kid in, man. He had a good look. He had good size. Let's see what he can do. Let's take him to the interview room next time. Have him do promos. See if he can talk." But, you have to look the part. Perception is reality. If, you're, if you come in wearing a suit, you come in wearing nice clothes and everything, they go, wow, and this guy is on the ball. This guy's trying to make an impression. If you come in all loud and act like you already know everything, well, they're going to also say, wow, this guy's a jack off. We want to bring them back. Always, always, always have respect for the guys who came before you because they blazed the trail. Some of these guys, yeah, they're old, and some of these guys will talk about, man, back in my day, we did it this way, kid. You should do it this way. Well, that's not always true because it's today, and it's your way. And times have changed. But at the same time, those guys did blaze the truck. Those guys did do it for you. They, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here today. Terry Funk is one of the most knowledgeable guys in this business. I think his book is, is probably the, the, the best book that's come along. And I say that because it talks about the business, it talks about the, the, the way things evolved and the way he can still be today. Not necessarily put himself up. But, again, etiquette, attitude can bury you, or attitude can make you. If you have a shitty attitude, I promise you that will sink you bigger than anything. I know because I've had a bad attitude. I've had a shitty attitude for years. And I couldn't get in WWE because of it. I had a brother who worked in the office, but I had a shitty attitude. And I didn't even know it. Sometimes you don't know you have a shitty attitude. And it takes people telling you and getting in your face saying, you know what, you're a flaming fucking asshole. When I got signed by WWF at that time, investment man himself said, Tom, when I first met you, I thought you were a flaming fucking asshole. And that comes from boss. So. You don't want uh, Vince to tell you you're a flaming fucking asshole. Doesn't make you feel very good. So when you go backstage to Raw or SmackDown, if you ever get asked, proper etiquette, shake hands, dress properly. Don't act like you know everything. If you want, if you want to, want to get some advice, don't be afraid to ask someone, one of the agents when they're not busy. 
Ask them if there's anything they can do. Ask them if there's anything uh, that they see that you might be able to improve on. That's what it is. But you also have to have, to make it in this business, passion. You have to live, eat, sleep, and drink this stuff 24 hours a day. You have to constantly be thinking about this stuff. It's difficult to do if you have a job, if you have kids, you're married, and all that bullshit. But that's what it takes. You have to dedicate yourself to this. And after you do that for about 10 years and you're still not there where you want to be, I always say, don't give up. It's perseverance, perseverance, perseverance. Eminem, you guys know them? Joey Matthews, Nitro. Scoop on them was, don't want them. They're too small. Don't see anything in them. Until the right people saw their tape, and the right people said, yes, let's give them a shot. So I do not believe when people say they'll never make it. The ones that don't make it, I think, just didn't try hard enough. Didn't really want to make it. If you want it that bad, I do not believe anybody can deny you. If it's not happening here in one place, you need to travel. You need to get out. Get yourself known. Uh, Austin Aries, another guy, with Sean Navari, used to come to a camp to every camp I did all across the country. And I was doing a lot of them. They used to drive to every camp I did just to show they wanted to be seen again. Austin made his name in the Ring of Honor, I know, but I wouldn't doubt if he made it to the WWE if he really wanted to. I think right now he's happy where he's at. But Sean Navari made it because he kept calling. He was persistent. He used to call once a week at the office just to say, hey, I'm still here. That's what you guys need to do too. If you really want to, I'm talking to only the guys that are looking to go to WWE, next level. If you want to go there, if you want to make it, you need to send tapes. You need to send recent pictures. You need to call Tommy Dreamer and introduce yourself. Just to touch base. Leave your number and location because Tommy might be coming to uh, WWE might be coming through town Tommy needs extras Tommy needs something he can call you get in touch with you you never know always be ready don't say well when I get my shot I'm gonna start working out no start working out now be in shape look the part don't look like the guy that mows grass Nobody wants to see them. And act like a professional. When you step in the ring, be a professional. Find out who you are. How do you get ideas for who you are? Movies? Songs? You never know where it's going to be. But you've got to find out. Who are you, man? What, what are your hobbies? What do you really like? I mean, are you cocky? Humble, who are you that translates into wanting people want to watch you on WWE? Eddie Guerrero's talented, Eddie Guerrero has charisma, that's why he got a shot. And he's one of the best workers in the business. John Bradshaw Layfield, a lot of people knock him because they say he's not championship material. He, lo he knows that. John knows what people think of him. That's why he goes even farther with it by saying, I am a wrestling guy. He knows he's sticking in their face. He knows he's not the greatest worker in the world. He knows that. And he uses that. I don't know how many title shots he won or how many title matches he actually really won. He always snuck out the heel way. But he is who he is. That's really the job. Being the uh, uh, financial analyst that he is. All right. Um, anybody have any questions?
uh, going today. If, if this can can bury, man, and I think it's happened to a lot of us, it happened to most of us. We let our head get to us. People telling you you can't. Mind's a powerful thing, man. Put your mind to it, and I believe you can do anything. If I always said, if I could get in this business and stay in it as long as I had, anybody could. Because I'm nobody special. I'm no different than you guys. This is all I've ever wanted to do. All I have ever wanted to do. Where is um, the girl? Last night, so she'd be here. Um, you guys know the girl with glasses, uh, the yeah. boyfriend from Illinois? Huh? Long. Well, kind of heavy. Yeah, Michelle, small girl. Long. Yeah. Yeah, Michelle. Michelle. Michelle, I, I didn't remember this, but she told me that I talked to her at WrestleMania and told her to find a wrestling school. She said, Well, I'll listen to you. And I found this wrestling school, I'm going to do it. Okay. Well, that's the first step. Taking that ambition, taking that initiative and going to wrestling school. I'm not going to say she's going to be a big superstar. No, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying she wanted it bad enough when she found a school. She came to it. She's doing what she wants to do. Which is more than some people will. So if you look at it, but have to work with the people who won't know how to do the high flying moves and really don't know how to ground themselves and whatnot. What do you suggest on how they can uh, pull them out and persuade people to work the correct way? They work. Good question. This business is a work. Life is a work. What you will learn as you go along. Let's talk about politics here for a minute. Politics is everywhere, guys. Whether you work at Walmart or the gas station. Politics is part of life. Politics in this business is something that I've always hated because I hate dealing with that shit. It's such horse shit. But it's a reality. It really is. What you will learn as you go along, some people are so much better at it than others, to be persuasive and to explain to somebody if they want to do all these high flying acts and you sit there and you do it the correct way, which is part of being a worker backstage as well as on stage without being a bullshitter or without being a complete asshole or liar. It's called working. It's called taking care of yourself. In the old days, they used to say you have to be selfish to be on top. It's still true to an extent. If somebody's doing that, you have a couple options. You can go somewhere else to where they don't have that philosophy. Or you can talk the guy into what you want to do, making him think it's his idea. That is a uh, talent that some people have, some people don't. But you have to learn how to develop that talent to where if they want to do all this bullshit and you know it's not right or you don't feel comfortable doing it, you have to know how to approach it and suggest something that is just as good not doing it that way. It takes a lot of a lot of learning and a lot of experience doing it. You have to figure out the scenario that you want to do before you get there. Knowing that somebody's gonna try and want to do their shit where it's all high flying. You keep some of their stuff in, but you tell the story the way you know it should be told, and you get that stuff into it and lead into their, their spots. We don't do all that shit. They said maybe one or two times in the match. You learn how to work. And you learn how to get your stuff over. And that's a straight answer, guys, because that's what goes on in this business. It's 
Politics? Yes. There's politics in life. Um, I wish everybody could be straight up. I wish the office could be straight up. I wish everybody could tell you the way it really is. But not everybody can. Because not everybody can handle the truth. And not everybody can, can decipher that. Unfortunately, what you're going to find on the independents too is a lot of guys who don't want to hear that shit. A lot of guys who want to go out and do all this stuff anyway. That's where I suggest getting your name out and going to other places too. Uh, I think Jim Kettner, don't know how he's thought about it around here, but I like Jim. Jim Kettner runs a pretty good ship and he, and he wants to tell stories the right way where you build you tell stories with the whole, you don't just do spots for the sake of doing spots. You do spots, but they're done at the right time. That's timing in the business. Learning when to do the, the, the flashy high stuff, but, but how to chain it together. What do you do in between all that stuff? How do you put it together? It's, it's an art form. And that's why it takes time to learn. Sometimes it takes years to get that seniority and years to get that, that stroke we can, can suggest. Well, maybe we do it like this. Maybe if we work into that one spot, instead of just going bam, 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 bam. But you have to have something better or, or different. And you have to be convincing. It's an art form. Some people say you have to learn how to know how to bullshit. Okay, you have to learn how to know how to bullshit. That's really what the business is. And that's the way you do it. And if they don't want to do it that way, then maybe you find another place that will. And you get your name out there. I know guys who drive 15 hours sometimes, go down south and work places and come back. And God, man, it's, it's expensive. It's mind-wracking. It's, it's, it's hard on your body, hard on, or hard on keeping a job. But so I say there's a lot of elements outside what goes on in the ring that really encompass the whole business. It's tough, but that's what it takes. You have a question? Yeah. When you watch Ted Um, I've had I've had them send both, but it's better I think in a show, but so you can see what uh, what you do in a practical situation, how you handle stuff. And the main thing that when when I was looking at tapes was was again timing, selling, um, presentation, um, and how you how you present yourself is huge because is, is it real? Does it come across as real? Um, sometimes we don't know what we're looking for until we see it. Can't, can't always tell you. There, like, like I said, there's not one formula to follow that will get you. If, I don't know any two people who've got them to be the same way. And not all, not everybody they've signed have, have been winners. And not everybody they've signed have been what we're looking for. We thought they were, but you know, you get, uh, you get full. So, um, any other questions? I do have some, yes. Um, Body-wise, if you don't feel like you're ready, should you wait to send the tape, or should you just send one to get your name out there? Uh, how long have you been working? Like a year. Yeah, it might be better to be ready and to look ready, body-wise. It might be better so you don't get that first impression of, uh, you know, although sometimes I'll say it both ways. You send the tape and then uh, the guy tells you, or I, I, either myself or Tommy would say, you need to work on your body, and you need to work on certain aspects of your work, and then you send the tape six months later and then you see such vast improvement. So, but I, I would think you'd want to send these days a tape that shows you ready. Yes? How did you volunteer to help out at WWE and, and who do you speak with? Uh, here, for instance, is, is this your main school? No, I lost one train time. Where? Uh, Alpha School. Alpha. Uh, speak to Alpha because I know that when I was doing stuff too, we call Alpha. 
for extras and keep your name out there. Let them know that you're, you want to do that stuff. And, and when Tommy calls out for guys when they're in the area, make sure you're there on a consistent basis. Make sure you, he knows you want it and not just want to be on TV for that one time, but you're there for the whole time and you talk to often and let them know. Definitely. Yes? The difference in baby face selling and heel selling. Baby face is trying to, and again, I know this is a, a, a different time or a different era in the business where not all the baby faces get cheered, but a baby face like Ricky Morton, a young Ricky Morton. And by the way, does anybody not know who Ricky Morton is? Okay, that's okay. The reason I say that is because I was telling a kid one time in, after a show, you need to sell like Ricky Morton. Get that sympathy sell. Oh shit, you're begging and, and your head's up and you're trying to get the people with you. A heel sell is more like, ah oh, shit, begging away. There's two ways of selling it. The baby face is selling with pain, the heel selling with pain too, but the, he, the baby face is more or less trying to get the sympathy of the people and he's trying to to, to get people within the heels trying to go, oh shit, and really sell and oversell like God, you know, let go and begging off. Whereas the baby face again is coming forward, the heels walking backwards. That's that's a general tempo of the match too. But um, as far as selling holds, let me just get, get this out of the way. Selling holds, if you're in pain, you're in pain. The heel needs to sell it, you know, like he's in pain, for real pain. So does the baby face. But as far as selling in a match, uh, and a baby face getting hot, you son of a bitch, the heel is more like, whoa, wait a minute. If the heel's getting on the baby face, and he can show that, oh, take his time and look around, son of a bitch, you know. And the baby face is more like, come on, and he's fiery, and he has that fire. Again, that's a, there, there's something the baby face needs is that undeniable fire. If you have it, you have it, man. You gotta find that fire and go. The other thing is too, you guys need to be a ring shape as a baby face and a heel because at the end, after that baby face been beat on and he needs to have that fiery comeback at the end, you need to have gas in your tank. There's a big difference between ring shape and cardio shape, guys. You need to be in ring shape enough that we have gas at the end so you can blow that comeback. And if you if you get blown up on that comeback, or you screw it. Screws the heel, screws you. Everybody can see through it, and that'll kill you better than shit. The selling, again, the, the easiest way to describe the selling, the baby face is coming forward, walking towards you, and the heels stay on. In the holds, everybody's selling the pain. You gotta feel it. Even when there's there's no pressure on it, you have to really feel the pain if you know what it feels like. So you're not overselling it. Ah, you're doing bullshit. That's why whenever somebody has, you know, a, you know, a chin lock or, or you know the camel clutch or whatever it is, and people are doing this shit. Well that's funny as hell. Because if somebody has you around the neck, it's here. You're trying to release the pressure. You have to think logically. And when you're selling, if, if you don't know what it feels like around there, I mean, and, and, and you're trying to fake it, phone, be phony, God, it's gonna look so bad. If somebody really chokes you, you're not gonna be going like this. If somebody's choking you, the natural reaction is go here with it, choke it, try and relieve the pressure. These are just little things that the old timers, again, when you're watching some of these DVDs, some of the matches, I'm not saying copy them, I'm not saying do everything they did in the match, but watch the psychology. Watch how they built it. There's a match that happened, I believe now, it's been three Christmases ago, two Christmases ago, to Triple H and Shawn Michaels in San Antonio, Texas. When Shawn, they thought he was going to win the belt in, in his hometown. They had a roller coaster match. They were, they knew how to make the people sit down, stand up, scream, cry. Boo, cheer, 
They owned them. They were conducting that match. That's what you need to do. That's what you're looking to do. You're controlling your emotions. The way you do that too is by false finishes. You need to have some false finishes in there where it looks like, oh no, here he is, oh boom. There's, there's things you can do um, that are very simple. And what I wanted to do with some of you guys brought you here is explain them to you in the ring and have you guys do it. Not a whole lot of stuff, but just two drills that we used to do in OVW. They still do, still do them, but I also do them on uh, the camps that I come out and do as well. Okay, there are seven pretty basic false finishes in the business. Um, and you need false finishes in your matches. It's the drama. We're looking for that dramatic ending. We're looking for the people to be up and down and roller coaster, boom, boom. It's that's what the fans want to come and see. They want to come and see that that match they can get into and scream and yell. Hell, even if they know it's predetermined, we know who's going to win. That's great. But you go out there, you give them a hell of a show. That's what you want to do. There are seven basic false finishes, and what I want to do, I'll tell them to you in a minute is pair everybody off and it's a heat drill basically. The heel, one, one guy will be heel, one guy will be baby face. The heel stops the baby face, gets a little heat on it, and then he puts him in these positions to where he gets caught in these seven false finishes. Not necessarily in a row, not necessarily in order, but they're very simple and very basic. Okay, they are sunset flip, small package, schoolboy, backslide, O'Connor roll up, a cross body, and when you go to slam the guy, anybody ever seen when the guy kicks his legs and he falls back, you call that kick the leg. Seven very false, very basic false finishes. Also, what we're going to do, I'm going to add these in to another drill that we call the dance. When you're out there, what you guys are basic, basically doing is dancing. You have a leader and a follower. The heel is the leader. Has, any, has anybody here, uh, I know you guys are, are pretty novice, but anybody here ever been in the ring and not know where they are? I mean, not know what side of the building they're, they're coming up on? Have you? Well, I have. A lot of times. But sometimes, if you're doing a TV tape, for instance, or you just happen to have the manager that needs to be on this side of the ring and this is where you need to wind up on, we have the drills where I'm telling you, this is where the finish is going to happen right here. And you need to wind up there on this pump at the end of this drill. It's called the dance. And what we do is this take two guys. I say one is offense, and he starts the circle, lock up, or grab a headlock. Other man grabs the top wrist lock. You've done this right, Nick. Here. Grabs top wrist slot. Dan reverses it. Another guy reverses it again. Grabs a headlock. Takes the guy over. You work your way up slow. Shoot the guy off. Two tackles. Hip toss. Arm drag. Now the offensive man has the arm drag. Arm bar, excuse me. You guys work your way up. Man in the arm bar, give you two forearms. Shoot him off with two tackles, hip toss, arm drag. 
Now the offensive man is in the arm bar. Come up. The offensive man gives the guy two, four. Shoots him off. He ducks down. The man running. Leaf frogs. Got offensive man. Offensive man stays in the middle of the ring. Hits the ropes. Offensive man leaf frogs. The other guy hits the ropes again. Goes for a slam. Drops behind the offensive man. Goes to roll, roll the offensive man in the ropes. He holds the ropes. The other guy rolls through. Offense comes through the clothesline. He ducks it. The other guy comes back. Clothesline's offensive man. It's a real simple spot. It's all about timing. After we do the clothesline, you come up. The offensive man is going to be the, the heel in this. We're going to add all this together. We're going to do the uh, seven false finishes right after that. Okay? Everybody understand? Good. I'll call it anyway. Once you guys get, if you want to, you, know, you guys want to stretch out, I'll tell you what, I'll give you like 10 minutes, and then we will come by the ring and we'll get in the ring and do some stuff. How's that? for knowing where the finish needs to take place at. And the reason being, again, where's the manager here? Do I have any managers here? Managers? All right. Managers, you're going to be on this side of the ring. Okay? And the finish needs to take place on that side of the ring. Let me explain to you again. What's going to happen? You're going to circle. You're going to lock up. You're going to grab a headlock. You ever do a top wrist lock? No. No? Um, it is a lock up. Grab it. Okay. Okay. 
lock up. Go ahead, lock. You got to grab the top of the lock from here? Um, no. Bring your right hand. There you go. Now grab your left hand. No. Nick, grab it right here. No. No, 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 no. There you go. Got it. Now, step forward with your right foot. Keep turning. No, no. Step forward with your right foot. Step forward. Turn. Right here. Now bring your left arm, left arm. Bring your left arm. Release, release. No, release. Release your left arm. Bring it on the inside. There you go. Now, you want to be here, not out here. Here, okay. Okay, up this way. Yeah. Lock up. Lock up. Okay. Top bristle. Step forward. No. Step forward. Now reverse it. No, step forward with your left foot. Go underneath. No. Go underneath. Go behind. Go ahead. You gotta reverse this. Reverse. Hold his right shoulder into the head. Now, here's another thing. Step back in that corner, please. There you go. Watch my feet. And this is, this is again, one reason why... One reason why... Some people like strawberry. Do not go over. Okay? Again, I've got my hand up. Look at my head. i got it up. I'm not down like this. My feet are bent. I'm like on a railroad track, facing this way. I'm going to step through with my left foot. I'm going to bring my right foot behind. See how he's got my hip to go over, and my right foot is past his, and I am posting with my right hand. So I'm not whipping him over. Okay? You just whipped him over, didn't post with the right hand. So I'm posting with my right hand, he's got my whole hip to go over. And again, my right foot is past his feet. They are not in here like this. All right. Okay. Here, and now I'm going to go down on my left knee. And then sit on my ass. Now, I like... Now, I'm sorry. All right. All right. I keep going. Sorry, man. I think I'm full of shit. Now, he's going to roll towards me. Roll towards me. I'm not going to let go of the headlock. I'm going to come to my left knee. Then we're going to come up together. We're posting. Okay? And watch again. Here we go. Watch my feet. Stepping through. Bring the right foot down. When I do, I'm posting with the right hand. See where my knee is? See where my feet is? Past his. He's got my whole back to go over. Then I'm going to go down. See my ass. Then he rolls up. Here. I don't let go of the headlock. All I'm doing is coming to my left knee. Coming up. Okay? Got it? Yep. Perfect. Step through. Now bring this hand inside. There you go. Bring him 
left foot. Get your right foot where my foot is. No, where my right foot is. There you go. Right, where you've got your whole back forward. No, do not let go. Now let go of the head lock. Okay. No, just put your right hand down the post. Down to your left knee. Go. Okay, now sit on your ass. Bend your right leg. There you go. Roll towards him. Don't let go of the head lock.
Two forearms to the chest. He's going to give you a call. Thank you. 
side too when you're on the road. What you're doing is here, boom, trying to release it, trying to loosen it up, boom, and you're shooting from here, out of the arm bar. You don't slide down, because if you're already out of the arm bar, you go bam, bam, you're already there. Why are you shooting him off? You're out of it. You still got it, but you're just trying to send him off here, like, oh shit, and then you go, oh shit. Trying to get out of his way, you know what I mean? That's why you're ducking, so you're not just going, oh, here's the spot we're doing, by the way, let me bend over. And if you're throwing this way, you're not going to wind up over there. Okay? Alright. Let's start over. Circle. Real simple spot. Take your time. It's about timing and ending up where you should be in the ring. Okay, top first lock.
him off, you duck first, he's going to leapfrog you. Keep hitting the ropes, and he leapfrogs you. Come back, you drop him behind, you're going to roll him up, you're going to hold the ropes, you roll through, that's a close line. Reverse. 
Shoot them all. Two tackles. Hip toss. Arm grab. So you're right. Give him a tackle. So you're right. Get up. Hip toss. Throw. Arm grab. Come on up, roll back. 
to the rule. But if you're going to take a bump, and I know this is 18 by 18 right, but if you come to your left, look where you are. You're crowding the guy. If you take a bump, come to your right, and you go to meet him, instead of just standing there saying, hey, give me a tackle, shoot the guy off, he goes. That's what it looks like. Looks like you're waiting for the guy to give you a tap. Slow down. If you don't understand something, you got to call the spot, or we're calling the spot, and you don't understand it, stop. Think about it. Even though I'm rattling off stuff, stop. Relax. Sit there in the hole. But the worst thing you can do is get in a rush, try and do these spots. And then they get rushed, and you either miss the guy by the line, or you hurt somebody, or you hurt yourself. Everything you do, and when I say everything you do, I mean from the time of. Uh, knee pad. That just tells everybody I don't have this guy and I'm not worried about the match. I'm working. I got my head up. People can see me and I'm selling it on the heel again. Shit, and it throws everybody off. 
but also you need to hold a headlock. So you show you've got it. Every little thing add into the big things. So if we're coming up, I still got my head down like this, and they can't see me or my feet like this. No, you don't want to trip each other up. Everybody has to see what you're doing. It's body language. Harry Funk, again, I will use this as an example, was one of the most unique workers during his prime because he did shit nobody else did. He did this drunken shit and throw these wild asses. It made him unique. He was working from the time, and sometimes he was working in the dressing room. But that's what made him so unique and such a great worker. Too many guys, are, and another thing, when you take the bump, you don't just get up like, like here, go. Sell it. Everything you do. It's selling. You're getting it over. The people want to see it. But again, here, here's one more thing. Guys in their corner, sometimes you'll see them just sitting there like this before the match, not knowing what to do. Well, shit. You're about to work with somebody on the basement, looking around. I check the ropes. Huh? Looking like I'm ready to go. I'm in a match. I'm going to win. I want to win. Convey that to the people. Tell them. Yeah. All this shit about everybody's smart, all this shit about everybody knows is going to win. Bullshit. If you convince them that you're in this and you're competing, let them get lost in it. Just because everybody else has told them that this is a work, don't rub it in their face anymore, guys. Try to bring the mystery back to it. We, we've let the genie out of the bottle. I don't think we've never put it back in. But that doesn't mean you can go out there and just have a half-assed match. What it means is you have to work that much harder to become real. Whether it's walking in the rain, wiping your nose, Little nuances, little little things that add up to so much. After you do a bump, or after you give a bump, or do a move, you don't have to keep going around. You can stop and let them sell it. And then it's again the way you look, or the way you walk around the ring, the way you stop. It's little things like that that draw out the match. You don't have to keep constant movement. You do have to have excitement. Yes, you do. You do have to have your high flying. Yes, you have to have your, 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 your that part of the car in there. But once again, I'll reiterate, Stone Cold Steve Austin has never done a moonsault. Neither has The Rock. They were the most over guys in this business. I don't believe Hulk Hogan ever done that. Either. Of course he had a look. Of course he was something special. But that's what we want. Those guys that look the part. Ray Mysterio is this tall, guys. He has to do something to make him stand out. He has to do that stuff. Otherwise, he would be just this tall guy. Just nonchalant or nondescript worker. But he puts forth that extra effort and he puts everything he does in the ring mean something. Don't know if you guys saw the match between Brock Lesnar and Rey Mysterio, but Brock Lesnar is a monster and should destroy Rey Mysterio. But they had a match to where it looked like it was feasible, like it was probably going to happen that Rey was going to beat Brock. Because they took their time. Every move that Brock did to Rey, he let him sell it. And vice versa. Rey did things to a big man that would be logical. If you're working with a big guy, you're going to try and break his kneecaps, right? You're going to go for the, the, the take his legs out from under the table. That's what they did. And when Brock did something devastating to Ray, he didn't just jump right back on him. He let him sell it. 
that's what the lost, the, the lost art of what we're doing is, is it's not being conveyed down to the younger guys. Because everybody thinks they have to do all the high flying stuff to get noticed. I'm not saying don't do it at all. I'm saying do it in the right places at the right time. The four way match last night I thought was excellent. I thought they had a good story. Very good story. Enjoy it. Some stuff, you know, they, they did some cool stuff, but there was no story in the match. And again, you learn how to tell a story by explaining to the people who the baby face is, who the heel is. Now, if you have an angle to go with it, then that's a different ball game altogether. But when I say everything you do in the ring should mean something, and I mean everything, from scratching yourself to adjusting your tights. If you're in a hole, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. A guy adjusts his knee pads. A guy scratches in a hole. If you're in a match and you're really trying to win, why don't you do that? Now, again, I'm talking earlier about the false finishes. A wrestling match should be about drama. That's what it is. That's why you have so many people coming to a fake, well, it's not fake, to a predetermined event and you get, they get so into it. Well, they used to, they still get into it when they have a good match when they have something they want to see. Why? Is, is, how many guys, raise your hands if you at one time ever in your life thought this stuff was real? Okay. As you get older and as you learn about the world, you understand that grown men cannot punch each other in the face 15 times in a match and come out of it unscathed, especially if you've ever been hit. You know that just doesn't happen in real life. But at the same time, watching this stuff, he's saying, holy shit, if the guy hits you with a forearm, or hits you with something like that, or hits him with one punch, and the guy sells that one punch, then you might think, holy shit. Jerry Law was the best at selling what was being done to him. If you gave Lawler a punch, he sold it and he went down and, and he let it go. That one punch, as opposed to being punched five or six times. Same thing with a kick. You don't have to do five, six shitty kicks. If you do one or two kicks and the guy sells it, that's a hell of a lot better than five or six shit. Same with a punch. I've seen too many guys, like I said, get punched, they're going, oh, I'm going to call them the next spot. They're not selling anything. If you're a kid, I understand how you can look at that and think, okay. Because I believed it meant all the way until I was 10 years old. And I wanted it to be real. And it was more real then because the guys would actually give each other hard work. The guys that actually protect the business. Now, we're not protecting the business like we should. And that was a big mistake in my opinion. Everybody thinks they're smart. Everybody thinks they know it all. Everybody thinks they can do it. They can't. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of dedication. And again, passion. If you don't have passion for this, if you don't put this first beyond anything, it's going to be very difficult for you to make it. There have been big guys in this business who have made a lot of money, didn't have the passion for it. Goldberg did not have the passion for this business. Made a lot of money, big guy, should have, should have been a superstar. He was a superstar, but he had no passion for this business, had no respect for this business. You need to respect this business. You need to have the passion or you need to leave. That is what is missing today. Too many guys come in, the, come in here and think, I've seen it on TV. It doesn't look that hard. 
I know it's fake. I can do it. Hey, I can do stunts. No, it's more than just stunts. You have to feel this. Same thing when you're doing a spot. If you put the passion, the emotion into that spot, it's going to carry over in your training. It's going to carry over when you work. When you get in the ring, instead of just doing a, a, a drill, instead of just doing something that you're supposed to be doing, if you put that same emotion and passion into it, it's going to carry over into when, you, when you get in the ring. When Randy Orton first came to us, to WWE, and had a trial, he got in the ring, and the first time you locked up with him and you grabbed an arm or grabbed a headlock, it was natural. He knew how to react. He knew how to react to how that hold was being put on it. That's what you have to do. Too many people watch it and don't understand how that, how that hold and feel was actually put on you. Or don't know how to sell in a believable manner. The Benoit and Guerrero match last week, I think it was last week on SmackDown, was it SmackDown or Raw? SmackDown. They were so Eddie worked his leg, worked Guerrero's leg, and worked uh, Benoit's leg, and it was believable because they weren't overselling. But Chris was selling, just like if you actually got your your leg hurt. Instead of your leg going ah ah ah, he's going ah damn, damn, because that's the way it would be if you're selling. Like you know, sometimes it's like this, and then you go back and go, oh shit, no, wait a minute. But it's all body language to where it's real. We've told them enough that this isn't real to where everybody thinks, oh, nothing to it. I can do that. Well, bullshit. Not everybody can. And they find out, some find out quicker than others that they can. You're trying to give the people, and at the same time yourself, a hell of a show. This is supposed to be fun. That's why I think everybody first came here because you looked at it and you said, man, that looks fun as hell. I want to try and do that. But then you learn there are things you have to learn in order to do this well. Some guys are naturals. Some guys can just get in there and do it because they feel it. It's just part of it. Some guys it takes longer. But if it's not real to you, you cannot make anybody else feel that it's real for them. Again, I keep using Terry Funk as an analogy because he is one of the ones that it is as real as it gets when he steps in the ring. It's as real as it gets when he walks from that locker room. He is feeling it. He is Terry Funk. He's that outlaw. He's a desperado. He's that guy, man. He steps in the ring, you don't know where he's coming from. But that's what makes this business. It's about guys like that. It's about guys getting in the ring. And I'm not, and I'm not saying being, being that same way in the locker room and being a superstar on bullshit. When you step out here, you need to turn it on. You step out here, you need to be that guy. You need to be somebody special, different than the guy sitting on the front row. I've been a fan my whole life. This is all I've watched, this is all I've done. Some guys got into it later and watched it in 1997, thinking now they know everything. You don't. If you got into wrestling late, that's okay. But again, with the resources you have here, with the uh, uh, access to DVDs and tapes of old school stuff, and it, even listening to some of the uh, interviews, Talking about how it was in the territory and the psychology of, of the way matches got over back then, you can still apply it to this. Because just when everybody thinks they know what's going on, you throw them a curve, and that's when it gets interesting. With the Matt Hardy deal, has anybody been watching that? Okay. That was real as far as the lead up edge, Matt Hardy part. He got fired. Now he's coming back to do the angle. But some people think it's a shoot. It was a shoot. It was real. It's still real. But now they're doing business with him. 
The same thing with the Shawn Michaels interview last week about Hulk Hogan. I'm not going to lay down for you. Anybody who really knows Shawn Michaels knows that's the way Shawn was. Is he that way again? Well, all these smart fans out here think, oh my God, whoa, what's going to happen? It's piquing their interest. That's what you have to do. Instead of sometimes just going out and doing a, a wrestling promo, well, let me tell you something, brother. Hey, let me tell you something. If you get right down to the heart of it and you talk to the people and tell them, I want to let everyone here know that there's not a chance in hell Trent Acid can beat. But you say it with conviction. And you say it like you mean. And you build. Another real quick example, and then I want to do these finishes. Um, Mick Foley, when he was doing the angle with Randy Orton, and he came out and he made this interview, and he was talking about Randy, and, and the people started getting boring, and it was, it was chanting boring, and called Randy out, and everything else, and asked Randy to spit in his face again. Then he got loud, and then he said, Oh, would you spit in my face? Yeah! Well, now that's the real Cactus Jack. He built, because people were saying, Oh, shit, now he's getting in a boring interview, but Nick, Nick kept his cool and knew where he was going. He built his interview. He didn't rush it. He got the people interested. That's what you have to do. You're selling yourself every time you come out. You're selling yourself for those people. But why do they want to see, again, I know you have your cult following and I know people are going to come. But why do they want to see a guy that looks like their next door neighbor or the guy that delivers their papers? They don't. But if you want to make it to the next level, you have to ask yourself, are you willing to do whatever it takes? You've got to change your appearance. You've got to change your attitude. Whatever it is. All right. Who knows? How to do a sunset flip? How about a small package? Schoolboy? Backslide? Roll up? Roll up? Cross body? All you have to do on the other one is uh, pick the guy up for slam, he kicks his legs, fall down, fall down. Do you guys know the false finishes? False finishes? Huh? That's okay. Yes, uh, sunset flip? Yeah. Small packet. Yeah, they know them all. Oh, okay. Yeah, they know them all. All right, I need two guys in here to do it. You come in, referee. That was it. If you guys, this is your uh, responsibility as well. If you are down on the mat in the referee's county, you don't get your shoulder up at three, I tell every referee that I work with and do camps with, and the place I'm working in Tennessee right now, I tell both referees, if those guys do not get the shoulder up at three, you count. There's a few things that look worse than a guy going, one! Two! Should have shoulders not up, it better not count, because then it'll go, oh, there you go, you got a shoulder up. Instead of going, one, two, your shoulders not up, you're counting. Up to you guys to get your shoulder up. The referee has to have some respect. He's the law in the ring. Without that, it means absolutely nothing. And your matches have no credibility. So we have to respect the referee. Make sure you get up after you two. Okay? What I'm going to do is I will say your offense first, and it's a heat drill. So you go to lock up. He'll stop the baby face on that. You get on it, and these are hold spots. So you're not going to get a whole lot of heat on it, and you're not going to grab a hole. But you're going to give him, uh, you're going to call the finish. And call, you know, Get lost, I'll tell you where they are. Then you shoot him in, maybe some sort of flip, you put him in a position where he's making a false finish and he's trying to win. It's a hope spot. Okay? 
Count seven, false finish. And count three, come up and we will reverse roll. So we will do it. Offense going up. Sorry, the offense goes over in the end. No. No. Because he's got to do it. So we will do it. Okay. So we will do it. So we will do it. So that's false finish. That's false finish. That's false finish. Uh, at the end, at seven false finish, we just, we just end. In no particular order, we're going to be doing, again, this is a heat, a heat spot where you get the heat on it, and these are whole spots. So you put him in a position where he can you get the, the false finish one, two, cut him off again, do one or two moves to him, and shoot him off again, and do another false finish. Or do another false finish. Back to the uh, cross body. Second. Cross body, and then also spike them, we can pick off the first line. Sunset photos, all tactics, four to one, that's why we roll up on five.
the guy in. Everybody see this? What whatever you kind of see. If you can get in this on the front here, I'll show you something. You're gonna roll the guy in, the rope, you know how if you don't over rotate, you aim on his side right here. Okay? Let's sit down. And you don't rotate either. Okay. Come here. Okay? If you put on here tonight. Yeah you had him around up here. Put your hands down on his thighs and just sit back and roll. You don't have to pull him. Just sit down, roll, put your hands on his thighs, you wind up here. Touch your thigh. You're going to roll him in. And then throw. Put your hands on his thighs, on his thighs. On his thighs. Now just sit down. But you're rolling way back too, man. Right with the... I just, I'm not going to put it on the back. No, I'm just going to 
I can give you is keep coming to class. Keep coming and keep learning. Keep your mind open because if you do go to other places and you do work with other organizations, everybody has their way of doing things. Everybody has their way of running shows and explaining things. Uh, but not everybody is in it for your best interest. And not everybody cares about you learning the right way. Um, in order to learn this business, you need to get experience in the ring. And the real experience, the real way to learn it is in front of people. There's only so much you can learn in an empty arena. But, once again, if you can watch tapes or DVDs of some of the older matches of the guys that got over, or even some of the guys that you watched growing up and admired, and watch them for a different reason, watch and see how they got over and why they got over, and study it as a student of the game, not necessarily as being a fan, and say, hey, that was cool, but say, yeah, hey, that was cool. What did he do after that? What did he do after that move? How was their transition? Watch for that aspect of it. Also, attempt to learn those false finishes. Attempt to learn, no, learn them. Don't attempt. Learn those false finishes. Learn how to do it correctly. Watch the body language of people who do them when they do them, when you watch wrestling, because I will promise you, you will, you will see some of those in the matches. Watch and try to figure out, try and understand why one guy is over and one guy isn't. Bob Holly's a great guy. Bob Holly, in my opinion, is a tremendous worker. Why isn't he in Batista's place? Batista's not that great a worker, guys, but he has something. He has it. He has drawing, well, I don't know about drawing power right now, but he has something that is getting him over with the people in some sense. The way you really judge by if you get over is if you put asses in the seats. Look at Triple H. 
Triple H can work. Triple H really is a student of the game. Triple H really does understand this business. He can work with anybody and make them look good. Right now, Batista can't because he's green. Hopefully he will. But Bob Holly, again, is a guy who's been there for years, and he should be more over than he is. Why is it? I don't know. It's that certain it factor. And you've got to ask yourself, what do you have to do? Where do you have to go to learn this stuff? If you're not getting it, and I always I, I tell people this wherever I go, if you're not getting it where you're, where you're living, you're not getting uh, the education you think you need to get, move. Go somewhere where you can. Well, I can't because my family's here, my mom's here, and I, I have ties here. Great. Don't move. But if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you get. And that's been proved. It's not easy, and again, I'll say this, it's not for everybody. And not everybody wants to go to WWE, and I don't blame you. Not everybody wants to go there. That's fine. Even if you don't, and you want to stay on the independent, level, uh, independent circuit and do, do these matches, that's great, but be the best you can be. At least learn the basics and be the best you can be, so you don't get hurt, and you don't hurt anybody else. That's cool. I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people who do this as a hobby and, as a, and do it for fun, do it on the weekends. That's fine. But for those of you who are looking to make something else out of it and go to WWE or Japan or wherever it might be you want to go, then you need to get your name out there. You need to take those steps to be known, you need to take those steps to, to and it is scary sometimes to, to call up somebody and say, hey man, um, listen, I, I've been working for a little bit and I'd like to know if I'd come in and work for you. Well, I want you to send them a tape. I want to know about you. So you make sure that tape shows them you know your basics, you know the fundamentals, you have a good solid foundation. Because one of the things I look for when I got tapes was, does the guy know how to tell a story in the ring? Um, or is he just sending me a high spot fest? Because, you know, we, we, when I was there, WWE was looking for guys that could tell stories, and, and our mantra was, we're going back to the old school. We're, we're going back to the uh, uh, matches of working holds, getting stuff over, getting things over that way instead of just doing the car wrecks because it shortens careers and once you've done the ladder tables and chairs matches and all that stuff what's left ECW did go far so far with the flaming tables and barbed wire and things like that then what are you going to do next chop to get chop the guy's head off if he loses I mean I I know you have to do gimmick matches I know about Axel Rotten stuff, I know about uh, CZW, all that stuff. But there's only so far you can go with it until, you know, you've been there, done that, seen that, so what do you have to do to cross that bridge to get to the next level? Shoot somebody. Electrocute them in the ring for real. Kill them. Don't know. That's why WWE went so far to the edge with the hardcore stuff, they pulled back. Because, and this will prove me right, history will repeat itself. Hopefully. Come back all the way around and see the matches that, that you'll, you'll notice what's old will be new again. It'll just add a new twist. It'll have guys that can do it with a new twist and make it exciting and make it interesting. Professional wrestling can be exciting. It can be interesting. It can draw. If you have guys who know how to do it. Shawn Michaels, Triple H, know how to do it. Chris Benoit, Kurt Angle, Eddie Guerrero, know how to do it. Know how to give you good, solid wrestling and make it entertaining. The rest of the guys who try and do it don't always know how because they don't look the part. 
or they don't give a shit, don't really know how, they're just mimicking something. They're just imitating. But that's why you have to learn the basics. And, I, and, and it's, the way you learn it is by doing it over and over and over. This is about repetition, repetition, repetition. You don't learn this business in a day or two days, week, two weeks, two years. It takes many years to learn this. And I'm still learning about this business because it's ever changing. That's, a, that's the exciting part to me. It's always changing except for the fundamentals and the basics. That's one thing that won't change. But as far as uh, the spots and as far as the uh, entertainment value, there are always going to be new things. Always going to try new matches. There's always going to be trying. Always going to be somebody trying to invent something new. TNA has a six-sided ring. You know, the, the Hell in a Cell, the torture, the uh, whatever we're doing, torture chamber cell, whatever. huh? Elimination chamber. Yeah, that's. I worked for them for years. That's the Anyway, the Elimination Championship, there's always going to be somebody inventing something new, trying to be the next big thing. But you have to have people that can pull it off and be professional. So, um, work hard. If you're training here at the school, come as much as you can. If you have a job, I understand. John Cena moved to California to work at the wrestling school, to train at the wrestling school. Got a job at the gym where his hours could be flexible. Wasn't making a lot of money, but he did what he had to do to get where he wanted to be. If you want to have fun with it, have fun with it. Come to school and learn, know the most you can. So you can be safe in the ring for yourself and your opponent. The object of this business is not to kill each other. The object is to get in the ring and have a hell of a match, simulated combat, and be able to walk the next day. Okay? You don't want to be able to, you don't want to have to wind up in the hospital every single night. Any questions? Comments? Derogatory remarks. Thank you. Yeah, well, I thank you guys very much for coming because it was, uh, uh, I enjoy seeing the young, the next generation of the business, especially guys that want it and have that passion. A lot, of it's, a lot of the passion in business today is missing, and it's missing because um, guys watch it on TV and they see WWE and just think it's easy. Anybody can do it. <laughs> it's not just anybody can do it. Anybody can open up a backyard federation and put a ring in the backyard, but that's bullshit. So I thank you guys very much, and if that's it, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.